Hi everyone. Uh, today uh, I'm very pleased to be talking with Professor Fabrizio Nevola uh, from the University of Exeter, where he is Chair in Art History and Visual Culture. Um, Fabrizio is uh, an art historian uh, and the author of most recently um, Street Life in Renaissance Italy, published by Yale University Press. I say most recently, even though at the moment we're speaking, it's out actually next week. Um, so, but it exists. Uh, it exists in the world, and uh, we're excited to launch. Um, on the SRS website uh, as well. Um, Fabrizio, uh, I was hoping to talk to you today because you've been doing some really, really exciting work um, with apps um, as a means of exploring and discovering historical cities. Uh, this is something that I think will be of real interest um, to people thinking about new ways uh, of doing public engagement with Renaissance and early modern topics. Um, I wondered if I could start off by asking you to tell us um, about the Hidden Florence app. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Hidden Florence was um, started out as a project uh, some years ago uh, as, an as an experiment in how we could bring use apps as a way of bringing together essentially the what, what techie people call the affordances um, of smartphones, that is what, what phones can do. And the main thing there is that they're portable and they have GPS with um, the kind of stuff that we as um, historians, art historians do, which is some degree of interpretation through text. Uh, and so the idea with Hidden Florence, um, which uh, we I first developed with um, my um, collaborator, research assistant David Rosenthal back in 2013, um, was was to do exactly that, was to um, uh, think about how we would do um, some kind of a guided tour through uh, Florence. Um, and when we started out, we weren't entirely sure how we would go about doing it. Um, so we um, the, the, the way that that project came together was really, to an extent, serendipitous because um, I'd seen um, uh, some work done by the company we ended up working with, a company called Calvium, um, who had done a project with The Guardian using um, location-based storytelling around The Guardian's new headquarters in uh, King's Cross. Uh, and so it was as simple as, I like how that works. I would like to see how we could do that historically. And to be honest, then what happened is that we worked with uh, we, we, we got some funding through the AHRC as follow on funding and um, we put together um, uh, a, a sort of workshops with Calvium who helped us figure out how we would take um, a piece of historical research, uh, geolocate it, but then also make it appealing to an audience because um, one of the really important things about working um, outside of the field that we perhaps always are more familiar with, you know, in, in terms of format of academic articles and um, lectures to students um, or indeed to the wider community, um, is um, that you you, you, you kind of know who your audience is most of the time. And with an app, actually, you have to think about who is this for? And we kind of, to be honest, imagined a sort of um, late teens, early 20s. So we kind of imagined students, but also some imagined idea of what who might be interested in using an app rather than a book or something like that to navigate the city of Florence. Um, there were various elements that emerged as we went along again um, in this sort of discussion with with Calvium, the, the developers we worked with. Um, and perhaps the most important aspect of that was the idea that we developed of using a, a historical guide character, which perhaps we'll talk about a little bit more in a bit. Um, and also to um, to focus on the use of audio so that um, essentially we're using a smartphone. Uh, the phone really is a navigational tool, but we're using primarily the headpiece, uh, the ear, you know, the earphone features, uh, which is pretty standard, but obviously as a way of talking to the user while they're essentially focusing their eyes on what's around them. So we're not really wanting them to focus only on the screen. Um, the other thing that we, from the beginning, have made a feature of um, Hidden Florence and more recently in the Hidden Cities work that we might talk about also, um, is the use of historical maps. So if you like the most, um, uh, th these apps, essentially are what's called augmented reality. So they use augmented reality, which means that you are not hidden behind goggles, but you are in the world that we inhabit, but you use the phone um, 
the audio, but also the screen to add extra layers of, of interpretation to the user's experience. Um, and in a way, the most complicated technologically at the time was the map overlay of the 16th century map uh, onto the um, OpenStreetMap and now onto the Google Map that, um, that obviously users are very familiar with. And moving between one map layer and the other map layer is one of the things that I find continue to find very enjoyable about about the app um, and indeed that the, the seeing the you know familiar Google beacon appearing in a historic map is is continues to be kind of quite fun um, so there's the so hidden Florence basically what it does is that it pack the app packages up text the map and a series of audio files um, and um, a and and it's presented by a series of characters um, as I say, we started out in 20, with the 2013 funding, which was then published in 2014. And then we got some further funding after a lot of other stuff happened in between, again from the HRC, to extend the Hidden Florence platform and open it up um, by extending our collaborations to a wider group of uh, academics, um, both um, here in the UK and also in uh, primarily in Canada. Um, uh, Nick Terpstra and his group at the University of Toronto worked with us. Um, and so with that, we expanded the original one character app to a, an app which has six different walks in it. And you can therefore, through those walks, select different characters. And those characters essentially are not caricatures, but they are characters who represent different issues to some extent in the historiography of the social and cultural and art historical um, history of Florence uh, broadly in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and uh, what the app quite simply does once you open it is that it offers you a series of tours led by different characters and those tours, um, they're called hidden, uh, for a reason, the idea is that they try and take you into directions in the city that are less well trodden and to some extent to explore aspects of the history of the Renaissance, which are perhaps less well known to a wider to a wider public. Um, and their um, their the walks are set as as about normally seven or eight points on uh, perhaps um, uh, 60 minutes is about what we've aimed at as a walk, but some are probably a little longer. And each of these points, the character will tell you something um, about where you're at and how it relates to their story. And then you're offered um, a discover more audio in which you hear an academic uh, giving a somewhat more um, traditional interpretation, if you like, of the site. Uh, and then that app is um, is uh, locked sorry uh, is is uh, is uh, linked um, to a website that we've built that runs parallel to it where you can read short articles which are all shareable they're all they've all got a creative commons license and they can be cited um, they're all essentially authored texts that can be um, that can be cited and we found that are used a, a great deal our WordPress website has a huge amount of traffic through it um, it's great to see that you know that people can go from these itineraries and characters and then explorers they can hear from the academic they can read kind of that further work I was wondering about that so one of the things that's interesting to me here is the way that you've had to package obviously a huge depth of research into um, a particular narrative or a particular itinerary uh, or a particular character and I wondered maybe we could focus on um, Giovanni the 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 wool worker uh, of Florence is kind of I think the character that you started with and yeah. I'm interested there in you know how you wrote him but in particular in how you go about taking the masses of research that underpin something like this and turning it into a voice a route um, and an experience if that makes sense. Of course, yeah. Well, with um, so Giovanni, yeah, I mean, he remains uh, the character that I'm um, in many ways most attached to. Um, uh, this was, it was the first experiment. And I think it's important to say that it was very much a, an experimental um, thing uh, doing Hidden Florence. Um, it was a bit of a leap of faith, the idea of inventing a character rather than using an actual person from the archive. And I think the jury's probably still out as to whether it's better to go with the fictional, essentially a character who is um, a hybrid, bring, you know, drawing on multiple sources, uh, or 
trying to pin your character to an existing person who maybe exists in the archive and which you enrich to some extent um, through uh, additional evidence. Um, uh, and, and, and I think maybe a little bit of both is, is fine. With Giovanni, we were very interested in telling, a, um, if you like, a, a, the material culture of public space from below. Right. So the idea is that he's walking through the city and he has there are two walks in the original app, one in which um, he talks about the neighborhood in which he lives and the sort of everyday life in the neighborhood, which um, to some extent, well, which absolutely gravitates around his local parish church, the church of Sant'Ambrogio um, and uh, the place where he lives in a rented house, uh, the places where he goes and buys wine for his house or where he goes and buys wax for his confraternity when a funeral um, has to take place. And so through that um, narrative, essentially, we take a character who, in fact, if we wanted to, we can we could locate him. We chose um, we found a character. Well, there are plenty of Giovanni's in Florence. And we, so we chose a house um, from the catas from the uh, census of 1560 um, in which to in, in which to locate him. And when we're talking about some of the people around um, around him in the neighborhood, we're talking directly about the people who who um, we could document if we, you know, we could find documents to, to, to speak incidents he, he um, uh, encounters or describes. Uh, the fact is, is that this Giovanni did not do the things that we're suggesting he does, uh, but he he is the kind of person that would have done all those things, and for us, for us, that was that was really enough. And it was important to sort of essentially take people out of the centre of Florence. People do go to Sant'Ambrogio; it's a very sociable part of Florence. It's probably the place that people most go in the evenings for a drink there in Santo Spirito. Um, but actually, to think about that as a residential neighbourhood which was peripheral to the city centre. And then on the other hand, we take the same character and we walk him into the centre and think about the different way very much of a sort of history from below as a micro history, which is how we've thought about the character. Um, and we take him into the center and think, how would this uh, character have um, sort of um, encountered and um, felt about these big cultural sites, these sites of power and money, uh, about Orsan Michele, for example, where he's quite, quite um, um, uh, playful about the role of the Will Guild, which he is a cog in the big machine of, of the Florentine industry. Um, uh, and he has quite throwaway comments to make about the sculptures um, that he's looking at. Uh, but likewise, we take him past sites like the um, the workshop of the cathedral um, and met, reflect slightly on the sort of the, the physical manual nature of what made Renaissance wealth. And, and um, so to that extent, he's a character that is a little bit in contestation to the, to the dominant narrative, certainly the dominant, dominant tourist narrative um, of sort of elite uh, elite figures. Um, so for that reason, I'm particularly attached to him. Um, we also slightly, I'm looking at the screen where, he, you know, where, where at the moment, um, uh, we, we slightly cheekily chose um, uh, Vasari's um, totally fictional um, portrait of Masaccio to represent uh, uh, Giovanni and you know he's quite a look, good looking guy you kind of think yeah I, yeah, I wouldn't mind walking around Florida with this guy. <laughs> Man um, of turn. <laughs> he's bit, got a bit of a swagger uh, to him um, but yeah. I I think I love that. I like the um the you know the playfulness um that you find in it and the humor. But also there's a couple of things that I'd pick up on that. You know, one that you talk about, you're beginning with the Catasto records. You know, bringing those kind of um to bear on the creation of the story, but also maybe consciously thinking about pushing back a little at uh, the the more traditional narratives and itineraries um in you know a town like Florence that's so heavily touristed. And I think that's something that's for many of us thinking about doing public engagement um, of this kind, sometimes the question is, how do you do it in such a way that you appeal to a wide audience, but also maybe challenge some of the preconceptions or some of those ideas as well? And I think that's really a really exciting feature here. And um, I wanted to move from uh, Giovanni to talk about another uh, feature um, and something I find really, really interesting, um, which is what you've done with the Church of San Pier Maggiore. Um, and with this, what would he call it a tool or a section called San Pier Maggiore 3D? Um, and this is a kind of 
maybe historical reconstruction or reimagining of place um, using tech. I wondered if you could tell us a bit about it, how it works um, and what went into creating it, because it seems like an incredible labor um, to go through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, so in, in a sense, what we've done with the Hidden Florence, uh, the standard Hidden Florence app is that we've we're advertising, so to speak, a separate app, which is called Hidden Florence 3D, which was another experimental project, much, much more recent. So the um, the new Hidden Florence set of um, uh, which contains the six stories in it was was launched in the summer of 2019. Um, and by that time, I'd recently got some a, a, a completely new uh, research grant, which is a, 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 it's a, a you know fully fledged research grant um, in which there is some impact, but that's not the main focus. And this is done in collaboration with my colleague Donald Cooper um, at the University of Cambridge. Um, Donald had worked uh, quite extensively a few years ago on a first version of a 3D um, model of the lost church of San Pier Maggiore, which um, which stood on the Piazza San Pier Maggiore uh, in Florence. Uh, it was a Benedictine nun's convent and very powerful um, institution, but was demolished in the um, uh, in the 18th century. And what uh, Donald had started to do as part of a um, project with the National Gallery around an exhibition was to essentially do survey on that site and use a system called point cloud modeling, which is where you use um, very small sort of um, digital points collected by a laser scanner. I mean, you know, I mean and Hidden Florence is, it, it, it is interested in location. And we actually had used San Pier Maggiore as one of the sites in the Giovanni Walk. So what I went, I, I, I sort of said to Donald at one point is, look, I wonder whether we could take your model and actually geolocate it. So we, um, so what Hidden Florence 3D does is that it basically takes um, we through my new this new project together, um, which we're now calling Florence 4D um, because it's in 3D plus the dimension of time. Um, we uh, we return to the original model that uh, Donald had made, working with our researchers um, um, here in Exeter. We we redid that model um, uh, uh, and um, and we've we've essentially rendered it as a as a as the kind of model that you would encounter in a computer game let's say um, and um, and then working again with calvium and with another um, company that specializes in um, 3d for apps which is increasingly something which uh, you know every day uh, you'll you'll encounter every day whether it be you know putting a penguin in your kitchen or something or um, you know, whatever the civilizations TV program um, allowed you to interact with some 3D objects, like you know, like uh, like a mummy or something like that. We're using the same software, which is uh, something called AR Kit, so um, uh, which runs in uh, the which can be run on iPhone. And so we took the model, we built it at full scale, one to one scale, and within the screen of your phone, um, the, the 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 essentially um, you can launch this model and you can walk in it essentially getting the sense of the scale of a renaissance church uh, in your local park um, in fact we did this in collaboration with the national gallery where the main altarpiece from that church uh, is now housed and um, and uh, so basically the idea is that that app you will stand in the sainsbury wing um, press the button on the app the church builds around you in the Sainsbury wing and you as a user in 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 London will get a sense of what the scale of a church in Florence would have been, which, you know, at quite a basic level, um, you know, uh, and this is something we've talked about quite a bit with the National Gallery. Um, many, many visitors to two galleries such as the National Gallery have a very limited understanding of the original context of all these artworks. And um, even if it's quite impressionistic, giving people a sense of what the church looked like, how big it was that they can walk literally the length of the Sainsbury wing and they're still inside the church um, will give them a better understanding of the function of these paintings than the, perhaps they would normally have and back in Florence the thing works conversely um, the church is lost residents along that street or anybody um, can see the church um, essentially built back around them and it's yeah, it's kind of fun. Um, we've got a, a, a short video about it which explains it quite well probably better than I've just described it um, in words. 
but that's really fantastic. We're going to link to the video um, as well, but it was something that um, that got me very excited indeed, kind of thinking about kind of reconstruction or being able to to experience in some sense um, that building, even when the building itself uh, isn't there. Um, but something that's intrigued me about what you're, uh, the way you're describing this is the amount of collaboration it involves um, with people on the tech side. So with people who know software, um, who know augmented reality um, and how to work with it. Um, and you mentioned, you know, researchers at Exeter have worked on this, but also companies um, like Calvium. Um, what is the, I'm thinking here for people who might be interested to, to do something like this um, with their own research. How did you find the process of collaborating with, whether it's kind of tech firms, designers, um, and others from kind of outside of your, your specialist area? Mm. Well, I have to say, I mean, you know, it's one of the things I most enjoy about about my job, really. Um, uh, I, I think, I mean, it's quite complicated. Um, in some some respects, the most complicated thing is the uh, the institutional side from our end, from the university's end, because most of these relationships are governed by um, contracts, and contracts in universities are incredibly complex to negotiate, uh, in part because universities have big legal teams, so they have a lot of time to um, spend. <laughs> Uh, or whatever you want to say uh, on these things, where most of the time, even if you're working with quite big institutions like the National Gallery, and certainly when you're working working with SMEs, small and medium sized um, enterprises, um, you're you're working with people who pay lawyers by the by the hour and don't really want to pay them too much. And so, actually, very often that is one of the trickiest things about these um, collaborations with uh, outside providers is is balancing that asymmetry where where essentially the university is the big fish um and i think that the biggest thing i've learned and i did not learn it myself I, people pointed it out to me is is being aware of how those asymmetries work you as a as an academic you are not necessarily always providing someone with some great opportunity when you ask them to collaborate you have to make sure that it's a fair relationship um i think um i was very lucky um as I say, the starting off with working with Calvium was serendipitous. Uh, it just happened to be that I asked someone about something and they happened to know them very well. And I ended up um, uh, applying for funding in order to do uh, our first work. Um, and it's been a productive relationship, which is why we've continued to work with them. The tech behind Hidden Florence itself isn't enormously complicated. Um, we've built it up. We've made it more more. Um, user friendly for the academics and indeed one of the things we're looking at now is using the um, content management system which is essentially the piece of software that lives on your pc essentially uh, on your lap on your computer um, and allows you to build all the content from your office rather than handing it over to them to build it for you so we basically now can build the entire app uh, almost without um, uh, calvin being involved at all oh, wow. uh, and they essentially this time around they just had to press the publish button at the end i mean there was quite a lot of ironing out stuff as we went along but broadly that's been one of the great things that's come out of our most recent work and um one of the things that's uh, useful about that is that we we're we're in a position now that we're trying also to um, uh, look at how we could use that within teaching. So use it as a sort of te uh, as a package for uh, uh, how you might use this in in as a as a group work assignment, for example. If you were if you were doing a course on Renaissance Florence and didn't want to uh, write an essay, you could get students to work in groups to create uh, walks that they could try out on their phones, but then wouldn't be published. Um, in terms of the other the rest of the collaborations, I mean, you know, in a way, it's meeting people. Um, and then following their advice rather than being too rigid about what you want out of something. I mean, earlier on, you asked about um, uh, selecting material. You know, one of the first, the hardest lesson that we were taught was you can't get people for longer than two minutes in the street to listen to you. Now, I give a lecture in the street and people will listen because they've got to be there for a good deal longer than two minutes. But if they're on an app, I agree with them. And we've been quite rigid about two to two and a half minutes maximum audio time. The rest has really been just a matter of, well, I mean, in a way, I've got to say, it's, it's, it's probably the hard bit is, yeah, collaborations become easier if you've, if you've got the funding to make the collaborations happen. And 
there is an issue about the cost for all this sort of material. Um, I've been incredibly lucky that the HRC has backed me um, uh, with a number of projects that I've, I've you know, submitted and have been um, evaluated and, and then awarded. Um, most recently, we've had money from the Getty Foundation, which um, is really fantastic because it gives us another layer of sort of recognition. And it's, uh, you know, both in the UK and North America, it's very valuable to have that that Getty recognition through the funding, um, which has, again, helped helped do more. Um, and but what I've also also been away from the very beginning is that we're making something for free as well. I mean, well, the HRC is paying for it, but we the thing we make is free to the public. So actually, the other collaborations that have been essential are with the institutions um, on the ground. So whether it be the National Gallery in London or the Museo degli Innocenti in Florence or the Comune di Firenze and the um, UNESCO office, who have been incredibly supportive. And it's really helpful to have not just their logos, but in Florence, it's been incredible that uh, we were able to broker an agreement that that our app is promoted with the Firenze card, which is the the most widely purchased three day um, access all areas ticket that that tourists buy. Of course, they don't buy them at the moment um, uh, because there are no tourists. Um, but they can but, currently they can uh, stay at home and explore yeah. the Hidden Florence app um, from the comfort of their own homes. When you yeah. mentioned students designing their own itineraries, it really made me think of you know well we're all kind of stuck indoors, so we might as well explore Absolutely. Renaissance Florence uh, while we're at it. I was going to pick up on two things that you mentioned there, and um, the collaborations is the second one. I'll come to that in a moment. But the first one was about funding, um, and obviously the as you say the approach is, is is paying off, and this has kind of received received that kind of support. I know that recently you've been working on a major um, HERA funded project um, on hidden cities. So you're applying similar methods um, to a variety of other European cities, which are each um, uh, which have each developed their own app. Uh, could you tell us a bit about about that wider project? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean. Um... As I said, in 2014, the first app was published. And I, I got to say, I've got a line of failure. I mean, it's in my CV. I'm, I'm, I'm one of these people that puts failure in their CV as, well, as much as success. And I got a whole line of unfunded projects between 2014 and uh, can't remember when it is, 2018. Um, I was also setting up the History of Art Department in Exeter at the time. So I, I didn't do three grants a year. But it, the, basically, in the, last, in the last year, I applied for one uh, I, I decided, okay, this is the last time I'm going to try for another Hidden Florence. And that time we we got it, and that was, again, it was a follow-on funding from the uh, AHRC. And that's really what meant that I've carried on doing this. Um, the HERA funding um, is through... Uh, um, Hero is a is a it's called Humanities in the European Research Area. It's a it's basically a consortium of fund of funders um, like the AHRC that gather and then they get a bit of additional money out of the um, out of the uh, essentially the EC, ERC part. Um, yeah, um, and um, and that's a collaboration with five between five universities. Um, it's a if you like again, it's a traditional research project where we're doing. Um, actual research in actual archives. As it happens, we've been incredibly, um, f it's incredibly fortunate that we had a very large digital component as part of the project, because otherwise we wouldn't have had much to do over the last nine months. Um, and we focused all our energies, um, essentially, uh, since February of last year on um, on the digital side of the project, which was, was exactly as you said, it was essentially to take the Hidden Florence model and um, uh, deliver it to five different cities. Uh, the cities in this project um, are Valencia, Hamburg, Trento and Deventer in the Netherlands, as well as Exeter, my um, you know, home university city. Um, and uh, the Deventer app is done by the Groningen team and Hamburg is done by uh, um, FAU in Germany. And um, there it's been a very different sort of a pro uh, a, a sort of project from my point of view I've, I've essentially been sort of managing um, this uh, I've contributed a little um, but we've also been thinking about the ha what hap the complexities of scaling up um, so how we actually manage each team so that they're at the one point independent but we have some kind of editorial control so there um, um, the, the main researcher from our end has been again David David Rosenthal who was my RA has 
I've worked with David for a long time now, and he's essentially had sort of editorial control over each of the apps and helped each of the teams develop uh, develop their stories. Um, uh, they were actually published two days ago. They were published on the seventeenth, uh, yeah, the seventeenth um, of of November. So they're now live on the App Store and on Google Play. They're they're free to use as well, and we're planning. Essentially, they've all been launched with one story, and we hope to have additional ones added over over the next few months um, by those partners that, that that are keen to do that. Um, and uh, the yeah, as I say, the the there were different issues and complications with managing a distributed team, all of it online. So all of this has been done using Zoom and Skype and uh, email. Um, we met the last time in Trento in February, and we still hadn't got a full set of scripts. And the, these were published, uh, as I say, just now. Um, and it's yeah, that's been kind of quite a challenge. But it's also been something to keep everybody focused. Um, we've had regular uh, team meetings. Um, and uh, the one thing we probably haven't done as much as I'd have liked is testing on site, which which is fun, but is also really important. Um, and the other part that is new with this project is that we've built a much more complicated website that sits behind um, the project. Uh, uh, and is essentially like a database of all the objects and places um, and uh, enables um, uh, uh, users to sort of explore across the different cities, not just work on Exeter, but actually to um, through the website, we're actually encouraging people to sort of look at the commonalities, the sort of similarities in, in public space and how it was occupied and the objects that were um, you know, that sat at the sites of, trans of, 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 of use. So the, the way that people, objects, and place interact with one another through this website that that, that generates similarities. Um, so it suggests, okay, you're in a you're outside the you know a pub in Exeter. Here's a tavern in um, Trento, and you can read across the articles and see whether how similar to some extent these places might have been in spite of the thousands of kilometres that se separate them. So it's been it's it's another interesting. Another interesting exercise. If, if you look at them, they look very similar because they essentially use the same skin um, as Hidden Florence, the same design. Well, it's fantastic that people can, as you say, can now download them um, and get exploring with them. Um, something I noticed when I looked at the Hidden Cities website was, and you kind of gestured towards this earlier on, the extent to which these apps are resting on collaborations with universities, but also, as you say, with whether it's local or civic authorities, with museums, with galleries, and so forth. Um, I wonder if I could get you just as probably a final question um, to talk a little bit about navigating those collaborations and how you've uh, what they've brought to the project. Yeah. So, yeah, with with Hidden Cities, in a sense, we took for granted. I mean, it's it's obviously there was a piece of budget. Um, uh, the the collaboration with Calvium, who were the um, who, who again have been our, our, our technical partners to, to make the apps. Um, for the website, we've we've worked with a, a different technical um, partner, uh, a company that specialises in map-driven um, web design, a company called Axis Maps, and uh, the kind the website that you see is 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 more unusual than than it looks at first sight if you if you play around with it, um, particularly the sort of overlay of the maps, um, historic and modern, and so on. But core to the actual project was, as you say, was part were partnerships. Um, between universities and local museums, um, the idea, as I say, it, with the different, the main difference with Hidden Cities from Hidden Florence is that Hidden Florence, um, our character is 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 structured around character-led walks, i.e., a person in time walking and stopping at particular places. The feature that we've added with this with with Hidden Cities is that again we've got the same guide character, historic maps, place and time. Uh, to be is identified for each character, but we've put objects as well as a central part of the design. So what we're doing is we're taking museum objects from local um, museum collections, and we're sort of digitally putting them back in the place where they would have made sense. So if you're um, to take an Exeter example, if you're outside that tavern, uh, there will be a drinking cup, and that drinking cup is now in our Royal Albert Memorial Museum 
um, collection. You can go and see it. Uh, but the stories link together the people that would have used these things with the places where they used them in a, in a, in the, the, well, in a, in a, in a, in a meaningful way. The texts that we've written have also been written in such a way that they're useful to the museums. They can repurpose them into their um, catalog descriptions. Um, some of the items we've worked on are specifically chosen because they didn't have a catalog entry. Um, and obviously, uh, the apps are of use to the project team, but essentially we're also wanting to use to, to, for the museums to make use of them, to promote them. And because these museums tend to be in most settings, um, museums are quite closely connected to local authorities. Um, through that collaboration, we also um, aim to promote them through um, uh, the local tourism authorities or whatever it might be. Because one of the things I think that as academics, we definitely don't think about, and we actually don't put it in our funding, is we don't think about the fact that you make something that might be brilliant, or it might be quite interesting, or it might be cool, or it might be quite good. Um, but actually, you don't think about the fact that someone, to put it in someone's hands, you need marketing. You need someone to actually get it into people's hands. Um, and that's not something that is written into any of the grants I've um, had so far. Um, and, um, and partnerships can be one way to to do that um i don't think it solves the whole problem but it is one of the things to think about um the other thing which has been a complete and you you are probably weren't going to ask me this but i'm going to say it anyway um is that what a complete surprise to me is that apps generate um data we put data into apps that we want to tell people about but they also create data um that we weren't expecting we find and and um I know that analytics um, can be a dirty word, but um, there's a huge amount of anonymized data and it's totally anonymized from our point of view. We don't get anything other than very high level data. But from this, we've discovered, for example, that two thirds of users, um, between half and two thirds of users use these apps not in the city um, for which they were intended. So they're not using them as guides, but they're using them as armchair guides. Um, um, we've um, seen the changes in sort of drop-off rate. So how quickly do people stop using your app? Um, and in the cities, we're able to think a little bit about how successful, for example, we might be in decentering tourist use. So actually taking people out of the very congested parts of the city into other areas, which is of interest to other people, heritage professionals, for example. And so I've ended up with all this data that for example, my business school is really interested in doing, um, oh, in terms of sort of um, environmental tourism, are interested in doing publications out of. So there's all sorts of unexpected results that come out of these sorts of collaborations. Sorry about that extra bit, but I think no, it's, it's really interesting, interesting to think about for people. And to think about how a project like this generates its own next steps, I think is really, really, um, really fascinating. Um, well, I obviously know what I'll be doing the next time I'm in Florence or Daventer um, or Trento or wherever it might be. Um, and I'm probably going to be downloading Hidden Florence anyway, just to be one of those two thirds of the users who play with it at home to start off with. Um, but Fabrizio, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been really good to, to learn about this. And I know that it'll be hugely useful um, to people thinking about about using apps in their own engagement too. So thank you so much uh, for Not making the time. Not at all. And, and of course, the obvious thing to say as well is um, do get in touch. I'm quite happy to, um, I don't know, give any advice that might be helpful. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks very much. All right.